Hey guys, what's up? It's Ripe again. In today's story, an entitled neighbor repeatedly parked his massive truck on my property. I got him towed, he threatened to hurt me. I then ruined his life. Here is what happened. Subscribe to Ripe on YouTube and hit the bell to turn on notifications. I have just moved into an old house in the rural area of my homeland Estonia after getting through college. The houses in the suburbs that my parents helped me fund the deposit for. And I was excited. I was extremely excited to finally get a place of my own until I realized what a headache a bad neighbor could be. I mean, most of them are okay, but there's this one dude next door we will call Dan, which isn't. Soon after I moved in, Dan was introduced to me by leaving his pickup across our shared driveway. I was a bit confused and hesitant about making a bad impression, so I did not challenge him at the time and hoped it would not happen again. The next evening the pickup was there again, waiting for me as I returned home from work and with little choice or room left I parked my car on the road behind it. I knew I was blocking him in, but I was tired and I was feeling a little annoyed about it, so I didn't care. I was abruptly woken up at 5am the next morning to someone pounding on my door and windows repeatedly, although I was too dazed at the time to remember why. If I had though, I would have ignored it. Dan was furious that he could not get out of the driveway because his job as a farmer demanded him to be working early and long hours. He told me to move the car and not let it happen again, only good experiences with this guy so far. When he returned home later that evening, I peeked out from behind my curtains, choosing not to go outside to confront him over the incident this morning. He seemed pissed enough that I was using my part of the driveway as if he was entitled to all of it. I got in contact with parents the next week and told them about what was going on and after some digging we found the previous owner of the house, an elderly lady, that moved into a retirement home. I asked her about Dan and her other neighbors and she recoiled. Dan had gotten used to owning the whole driveway after he intimidated and terrorized her for years to the point that he almost packed her bags for her as he scared her out of her own home. Before she left, other neighbors reported similar problems of Dan leaving other vehicles all over the street, although, again, he was left unchallenged about it, so I felt he could get away with it. As summer was getting into full swing and the temperature rising, I was preparing to set out a barbecue in the front lawn and invite some friends over, setting out some of the furniture in the early morning, before I went inside to take a shower and get ready. An hour before the party started, I went back outside and saw a steaming pile of manure unceremoniously dumped over half of my lawn with a trail leading back to Dan's pickup. I knocked repeatedly on his door until all six feet of him appeared and loomed over me from the doorway. I tried to keep the conversation civil, but I was furious and he did not budge. He could do what he wanted, when he wanted and that was that. He slammed the door in my face and I called off the party. The next time it happened it tipped me over the edge. His pickup was blocking my driveway for the last time. Dan realized too late and came out of the house as the tow truck was leaving with his pickup. He immediately threw a fit as the rest of our neighbors came out to watch the spectacle with the usual thuggish threats and insults. You might be surprised to hear that our friendship only worsened after this with Dan continuing to leave his trucks, equipment and trash over my driveway and lawn with the intention of causing as much harm or destruction as possible and I bided my time in plotting a suitable revenge letting him think that I was giving up. Things escalated when I noticed he was not only rude but physically abusive when I heard cries and arguments with his wife echo late at night between our houses. I now felt a responsibility to put this guy down far beyond a petty vendetta. I reached out to an ad in the paper and hired a private investigator we will call Mr. X to tail Dan for a bit and see what kind of dirt we could dig up on him. After about a week I met Mr. X at a coffee shop to go over what they found out and there was a lot to talk about. Other than photographic and testimonial evidence of his domestic abuse, it turns out Dan was not paying his business taxes, whether intentionally or unintentionally, but either way big claims. 
I managed to sneak some of the photos under his door while he was at work and I waited for the explosion to occur. When he got home, his wife was already packing her bags. They erupted into a fight in the driveway where she confronted him about the cheating, but being his usual self, he refused to back down or admit guilt, leaving him cursing as she got in the taxi and sped away. I did not see much of Dan for a few weeks after that, he must have been spending longer hours on the farm or drinking as his bins were always full of empty beer bottles. It was not long until Dan's somber mood turned hostile again, it seemed he was more resolved to take his anger out on myself and the other neighbors as he had not learned from his first lesson, I put my next plan into action. The next morning, I wake up in an oddly satisfied mood. Even when drawing back the curtain to see Dan up to his usual tactics, I smiled and waved at him because he had no idea what was coming next. I watched and waited with childish impatience and excited, checking outside each morning until Dan received some bad news in the mail. I asked Mr. X on their final job to tip off the IRS about his tax fraud prompting them to send a thick envelope with the news that his business was being shut down. For the first time since I moved in, I saw some humanity in Dan when he broke down in the street, sad and defeated, he had no rage left in him. And yeah guys, I would say Dan definitely got what he deserved, however, this story actually deviates from the usual stories we hear, because for once, the farmer was actually not the good guy. Either way, let's continue with the stories. And the next one is titled Entitled Neighbors. So we recently went to auction and sold our house. The couple who purchased it turned out to be rude and titled twerps. We were very thorough in preparing our sale documents going above and beyond to detail all the renovation works we had completed. Due to public holidays in our open house period, we also had more than the usual inspection times and even opened the house privately for some interested parties. There was ample opportunity for checking everything out. Auction went fine, but the first sign of trouble came after. The couple took nearly two hours to sign the contract. It's explained to them that this is an unconditional sale, as in they cannot pull out of the sale for any reason without losing their deposit. They also cannot request a building or a pest inspection now and use the findings as a reason to back out of the sale and receive their deposit back. Those things are meant to be organized before purchase or you just take your chances, that is how it works here when it is an auction. A private sale has different rules, they then ask to purchase some furniture which we said we would think about. In the next days the real estate agent starts plaguing us with a number of texts and calls asking various questions about the property on behalf of the couple. What are the roof tiles made of? When did we last clean the roof? What is the deck made of? What is the material under the deck? Where is the storage battery for the solar panels? Have we had the aircon serviced? Etc. Etc. We answer all but it starts to become annoying and we advise the agents all of this info in either in the ad or the building report. Or it should have been discussed before the purchase, it starts to become clear that the couple are wealthy investors who have moved from another country and just bought the house off the photos. They then demand a building inspection. Our conveyancer urgently advises against this, if they were to find pretense to pull out of the deal, they would lose their deposit. Yes, but then we would have no funds coming through for the settlement of our new house. We don't have any legal obligations to say yes, so I advise no. The agents harass us for a week begging, but I tell them to drop the topic and it's a definite no. The couple then ask to bring forward the settlement date. We are actually okay with this, but the lady we purchased our new house from is not. To make the money work, we need to settle the old and new houses on the same day, so we have to say no, or else spend a lot of money putting ourselves up in a hotel for a few weeks. We cannot afford that and so we say no. This angers the couple because they then have to pay extra rent where they are currently living. We apologize but it is out of our hands. The agents harass us again on the couple's behalf but we stay firm. Another barrage of questions about the house follows which we answer. They then ask us which furniture we are selling them, we decline to sell anything as these people are just too much trouble. Then the couple ask for their pre-settlement inspection, this is normal to check that nothing included in the sale contract has been moved from the home, like fixtures and fittings such as curtains. 
It's legally not meant to be done until the seven days though before settling. They requested 15 days out. We tried to tell them to come on the Monday or Tuesday before the settlement so that the house is empty. However, they refused. We end up saying yes as we don't want them there while we have our storage containers on site and have scheduled time to be packing. We make clear the house is not in final sale condition and they are agreeing to settle as is with our goods taken out. They agree in writing. On the inspection day, we happen to have an old couch on the nature's trip awaiting hard rubbish collection. It's been completely torn up by our cats and not even any of the neighborhood scavengers have collected it. They are clearly upset that we didn't sell the furniture to them and accuse us of dumping rubbish on their property. We remind them it is not theirs yet and show them the council booking slip for collection. We drove around the block at inspection time and settled in the court opposite and watched them bring someone who we highly suspect was a builder on site without our permission, couldn't prove it though. Finally, we are packing our storage containers the weekend before settlement. We take a 5 minute break and sit inside with the front door and container open, keeping an ear out if anyone starts sniffing about our goods. Lo and behold, we hear people walking around in the driveway next to our containers. I am out of my seat like a shot and instantly saw these guys that are builders measuring our fence. I demand to know what they think they are doing. And they say they were told no one would be there and they were allowed in. I snapped and screamed at them that this was still my property, they didn't have my permission to be there and to leave. They refused and said, oh, we'll just be a minute doing this. I said no, they were trespassing and to get out. They start walking over to me being threatening and intimidating, getting in my personal space. I am a woman under 5 feet and an easy target in their eyes, I guess. At this point, they look up and see my very tall and large husband coming towards them and hot-footed to their car. I call the agents and my conveyancer in a rage and let them know that this is completely unacceptable and I will call the police if they are seen again. The couple deny they sent them. The day of settlement comes, all is good for the money, we hand our keys over and breathe a sigh of relief that this is all over. But it isn't. We get an angry email from the couple's conveyancer claiming we left goods on the property and did not leave it in fit condition for settlement. And also that as his client was not allowed on the property, he could not check for this properly. We reminded the conveyancer that his client already put in writing that they came to inspect too early and accepted the condition of the house. He attaches pictures of the goods they want picked up, it's a bag of rubbish we forgot in the shed, probably from the day their builders came and we were distracted. In the photos are also things like spare fence pickets and roof tiles which we left as a courtesy. Fine, we say, this is all too hard, we will come and get it. So we have to get permission to go on the property as it is not ours anymore. My husband gets there and starts packing up everything in the photo. The owners then freak out and demand that he leaves everything there. My husband refuses until they put in writing what they want left. Begrudgingly, they write that they want the fence pickets and all the spare bathroom and roof tiles left. Then my husband takes the paint tins we left. Remember, we just renovated before we sold, so we left some paint for touch-ups. They want him to leave it all there, but refuse to put it in writing, so he takes it all and the snail pellets too. Oh well, the garden has a massive snail problem, but they can pay out of their own pocket to deal with it now. In the end, all they really wanted gone was the bag of rubbish and the decorative steel panels at the back of the house. Which we left as a fixture slash fitting as per contract, but anyway, they just made a fuss as retaliation about the builder to inconvenience us. The icing on the cake? They demanded my husband change the alarm code for them on his way out. He told them no, it was not his responsibility to do that and also he had left them detailed written instructions on how to do it themselves. They said they couldn't figure it out, he shrugged and told them, get a technician then and walk out. By contrast, our new home, the previous owner left us a long handwritten letter explaining how the house works, some menus of her favorite takeout and her number if there were any questions. She left us spare light globes, electrical parts, fittings and spare floorboards. We were happy about that as we intend to change out the old carpet and can now match the rest of the flooring. We found that she left behind some handwritten recipes and cookbooks, we texted her thanks for the notes and would she like her books. 
She was so grateful, that is how it should have gone, the people we sold to were so awful to deal with. If they had been nicer, we would have left the couple a handwritten note of our own, explaining to avoid the neighbor on the right as he has no sense of social norms and the only way to get him to leave is to slam the door in his face. Oh, and also he has a severe pest problem on his property, it's a giant forest in suburbia and he doesn't maintain it. Oh well, hope they don't mind rodents, ticks, all manners of spiders, including nests of redbacks, jumping jack ants, eastern brown snakes and foxes. Or grass that is as tall as your shoulder. We also would have explained to avoid the neighbor to the left who we were sure was a drug dealer, bickies at his house at all hours, constantly having roof plumbing done, pressure washes his truck most days to clean the residue and in his off time he plays with power tools in a manner that can only be described as grinding a block of steel. Looking back, it actually was not a great place to live. I hope they enjoy. And the next one is titled Nail Revenge. I am a dry liner, which means I do a lot of moving around for my trade as most of the work I do is towards the end of most projects. This means that I spend a lot of my time renting flats and houses for only short periods, usually about 6 months at a time. This has meant that I had to have to deal with a lot of landlords over the years, both good and bad. When it comes to the bad landlords, I will normally just walk away and get on with moving to the next job and take the loss of my deposit and never use them again if I'm working in that area in the future, but this particular landlord got my back up so badly, I was not just going to walk away. I had managed to get myself onto a big job in London working on the new Wembley Stadium, so I decided I would look for a house to rent rather than a flat as I know I was going to be working on it for a while and found a reasonably priced, for London, house to rent from a private landlord in a local newspaper. I gave him a call and meet with him later that day, he seemed okay, went to view the house, paid him the deposit in cash and moved in that weekend. I ended up staying in the house for nearly a year with no problems, always had the rent paid into his bank account on time and fixed any small problems that might crop with the house myself without bothering him up, up to the time when it came to moving out only ever spoke to him twice on the phone, after there was an issue with the heating that I was unable to fix myself and he sent an engineer around the next day to fix the boiler. Come the time that the job was finishing, I went round to the pawn shop that he owned to give him notice that I would be moving out the following month and to let him know that I was happy for him to come around to inspect the house before I moved out so that I could get my deposit back from him when I returned the keys. He never came round while I was in to inspect the house and so I assumed that he had come round and let himself in while I was at work as I had told him that I had no issue with him doing that if need be. So on the day I moved out, I went around the shop and handed him his keys back and asked for my deposit. His response was, what deposit? The month's rent that I gave you in advance of moving in as a security deposit, I replied. He then told me he was keeping that to cover the cost of repairing damages caused while I was living in the property. I responded, what damages? With the bits of work and decorating I had done on the house, it was in a better state now than when I moved into it. His response was to step forward and get right up into my face and say, you're not getting it back, so F off. And he then gave me a shove which needed me to take three steps back to avoid falling on my butt. Now I am what you would class as average sized and built and this landlord had a good four inches on me height wise and obviously spent some time down the gym and the wise move would be to back away and cut my losses. Now, before I was a builder, I was a member of the British Army in a regiment called the Royal Green Jackets and they had trained us that the best way to proceed when confronted with aggression is to meet it swiftly and with much more violent aggression. So without even thinking about it, I started to move forward with the full intention of dropping this toward quickly and painfully. After the first step though, a thought popped into my head like a bolt from the blue, so I stopped and took a moment to examine the idea from a few different angles, said ok bye to my now ex-landlord and walked out of his shop. What the landlord did not know was that I had a spare backdoor keycard when I had lived in the house which I had stashed in my van in case I ever lost the keys so I could still get back in. So later that evening I let myself back in and decided to stop for one last night before leaving in the morning for my next job which was in Scotland. 
I spent the last night in the house carefully removing every bit of wood in there. I took down doors, removed skirting boards, banisters, architrave and floorboards being extremely careful not to damage anything. I also completely dismantled all the kitchen units, took up the wood flooring and carpets and I then left everything in nice neat piles in each room. I got in my van the next morning and was preparing to start my drive when I decided I wanted to rub a little more salt into my ex-landlord's wounds. So I stopped at his shop on the way out of London, got a spare hammer, screwdriver, bag of nails and box of wood screws out the back of my van and went into the shop. My ex-landlord was not there, probably for the best, so I left the tools with his confused looking assistant and told her to tell her boss, you will be needing these, and left for my drive north. I had my phone switched off while driving and a few hours later while I was having a bite to eat in a service station up by Nottingham, I decided to switch it back on and was greeted by a string of text messages and some very colorful voice messages which left me chuckling to myself. And yeah guys, if you ever had to deal with any awful landlords, then please feel free to share your own story either in the comments or on r slash ripe stories on reddit, which is our own subreddit. Thank you very much in advance.